Hey class, Mr. Hanji here. Today we're going to be taking a look at section 1-1, which is going to deal with segment length and midpoint. Now, in today's lesson, we're going to take a look at some different geometric terminology and talk about their definitions, how to identify them, what they look like, and how we're going to go through and name them. And then we're also going to take a look at three different formulas, and we're going to talk about how to apply them to the terms and the figures that we are going to talk about today. So, with that said, we are going to go ahead and get into today's lesson. And before we jump into content, let's go ahead and look at our three learning goals today. So, our first learning goal is you will be able to define and identify a point, a line, a line segment, a ray, and a plane. So, we're going to talk about those five figures. We're going to talk about their definition, what they look like, and how we're going to go through and name them. Next, you will be able to define and use the segment addition postulate. And then lastly, you will be able to find the length of a line segment and the midpoint of the segment. So we're going to talk about the segment addition postulate, the midpoint formula, and the distance formula. We're going to go through and apply those to these figures that we have talked about right here. So that is what's on the docket today, and hopefully by the end of this lesson and video, you will feel fairly comfortable with those three learning goals. All right, before we jump in to all of our terms today, one thing I just want to make a quick note of. In geometry, some of the names of figures and other terms will already be familiar to you from everyday life. For example, if I said a triangle, you already know what a triangle looks like in some of its properties, just as if I were to talk about a sphere, a cone, a point, a line, and so on. The beauty of that is that you can relate a lot of the stuff we're talking about to everyday life you already have a lot of connections and understanding. We're just going to build off of that and explain it a little bit more. So the beauty of your time in geometry is a lot of the stuff we're talking about, you should be fairly familiar with. We're just going to expound upon it. All right, so with that said, let's get into our first part for today. Now, this first section here talks about the most basic figures in geometry are undefined terms. So an undefined term is a figure which cannot be defined using any other figures. So it's not really the definition of undefined terms that's going to be really vital for us, but we are going to look at the three undefined terms in geometry and let's take a look at our first undefined term. So the first term that we are going to take a look at is going to be a point. I can get this centered here. All right, so a point is a specific location. It has no dimension and it's represented by a dot. So that is the definition of a point. In terms of its geometric figure and what it looks like, a point is a dot and it's generally accompanied by a letter. So in this case, I'm gonna put an A. The reason why we attach letters next to points is it helps us identify, and it helps you to know what point I'm actually talking about, because if we're dealing with a problem and it has numerous points, it's helpful to know which one you're talking about. Now, for the column in terms of ways to name the figure, Okay, so we're going to go in terms of naming this figure. So if we look at this figure, we're talking about a point. So that's the first part of our name. It's the name of the figure. And then we need to specify which point. Because there is an A next to this point, we are talking about point A. Okay, we're not just talking about a point, but we're talking about point A. A, the point A. So whenever you're asked to name a point, again, 
it's the figure and then whatever point you're specifically talking about and the letter next to it. All right, so that is our first term for an undefined term, which is a point. Let's talk about our next undefined term, which is a line. Now, a line is a connected straight path. It has no thickness and it continues forever in both directions. So that is our definition <coughs> of a line. Now, if we were to look at what a figure or what it looks like for a line, it's going to include two points. So let's go with points X and Y. Basic geometry understanding is that every line needs to consist at least of two points. It can contain more than two points, but every line needs to have at least two points. Now, so I have my two points. Based off the definition, it's a connected straight path. So we're going to go through and connect these points. So I'm going to use my handy dandy ruler. We're going to connect these two with a straight line. Now, the second part of this definition is that it continues forever in both directions. So while this is extremely close to what a line looks like, because we're talking about a line, we need to show that it continues forever in both directions. So we're going to draw arrows on the end of our lines. Okay, arrows on the end of the lines on both sides indicates it's a line. Okay, you have to do it on both sides. If you only do it on one side, we're talking about a ray. If you don't put arrows on both ends, then you're talking about a line segment. So a line has to have two arrows on both ends. All right, now if we were going to go through and name the figure, okay, much like we did with a point, we need to go through and identify what figure we're talking about. So because we're talking about a line, we're going to start with the word line. And much like we did with a point where we used the letter to help us name this figure so we can identify it, we're going to do the same thing with a line. But instead of using one letter, because that refers to a point, a line needs at least two letters to be named. So we're going to go with the two letters we have, which are X and Y. So we would name this line XY. Now, order does not matter. So if you preferred, you could do line YX. Okay. So key thing to know for a line is you need to have at least two points from the line to name it, but order does not matter. Now, that does not seem like it's too long to write out, but mathematicians have created a shorthand way of writing this. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to take your two points, your x and y. So we're going to start with that, and we're going to draw a little line above it, like that. Okay, that just prevents us from having to write four different letters in the terms of the word line, but it's actually a really handy and helpful shorthand. And this is really going to be how I write the word or name lines moving forward. Okay. It's nothing much, but it's something that is very handy and useful. And a bit of shorthand is always helpful. Now, if we wanted to do the other way, we could write this as line yx. So just make sure when you're doing this, again, order does not matter, but you need at least two points. And when you draw your line above, again, make sure you have the arrows on both ends. That is very vital because you're telling someone that you're talking about a line and not a line segment or a ray. All right, let's get on to our third and final undefined term. So our third undefined term is a plane. Now, a plane is a flat surface. It has no thickness, and it extends forever in all directions. So an example of a plane would be like a piece of paper, like I'm writing on, your computer screen, the table, the floor, whatever it may be. 
Okay, just think about a plane as a flat surface. Now, if we're going to go through and draw our plane, one thing to note with a plane, a point consists of at least one point, a line consists of two points, a plane is going to consist of at least three points. So if I have the points A, B, and C, okay, I need to draw a figure that encompasses those points. And generally, planes are represented using a quadrilateral, so a four-sided shape, much like that. So that is going to be our representation of a plane for today. A plane can be a circle, a triangle, whatever it needs to be. It does not have to be a quadrilateral. That's just how we're going to represent it today. Alright, so if we were to go through and name a plane, so like we have done before, we're going to start with the name of the figure we're talking about. So in this case, we're talking about plane. A point requires one letter. A line requires two points. That means a plane is going to require at least three points. So you just need to choose three points from that plane to go through and give it a name. So I could go through and name this plane ACB. You just have to choose three letters from the plane. Order does not matter in this case. So you could do ABC, BAC, or CAB. It does not really matter. Just three points from the plane. Now, unfortunately, unlike a line, there is no shorthand. So that is the only way we can go through and name a plane. So that concludes our undefined terms. Now, at the start, I had mentioned five different terms. So we still have two more terms that we need to talk about today. And if we have undefined terms, reason states that we have defined terms. So we're going to talk about two defined terms for today. And the first defined term we're going to talk about is a line segment. So I'm going to move this up so it's a little easier to see. All right, so let's go through and talk about what a line segment is. So a line segment is a portion of a line consisting of two points called endpoints and all the points in between them. So to represent a line segment, its drawing is going to look much like this. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with two points, much like we did with a line. So let's say I start with the points J and K. So if I have the points J and K, a line segment is a portion of a line that consists of two points that are endpoints. So that means the line needs to end at those two points. It does not continue on, unlike a line. So we're going to use our ruler again to go through and connect the dots. And then we end up with our line segment. So I have two points. J and K are considered my end points because the line ends at those points. And then it's all the points in between. So that is what our line segment looks like. Now, if I want to go through and name this particular line segment, Okay, instead of writing out line segment, we're just going to start with segment to specify it, because if we said line, we would be continuing on in both directions. So we have segment, and we're just going to use the two points. So in this case, JK. Now, order does not matter in this case, so you could say KJ if you would prefer. But for right now, we'll just go with JK. Now, before we move on to our last term, there is a bit of shorthand that we can go through and use to name a line segment. So, the way that we're going to go through and do this, again, we're going to use the two points, so JK. 
and we're just going to draw a segment above it. So we're going to draw a little line segment. Do not draw arrows on both ends or either end. You don't need to draw endpoints. You just draw a little line segment above it, and that refers to the segment JK. This is how I will go through and identify different segments moving on throughout geometry. It's faster, it's easier, and it's quicker, and you'll see once we move forward how it's a lot nicer to use. And then, like I said before, order does not matter. So we could say segment KJ. All right, so that is a line segment. Now let's talk about our third, or not our third, sorry, our fifth and final term that we're going to talk about today. Let's look at a ray. So a ray is a portion of a line that starts at a point, the end point, and it continues forever in one direction. So if we're thinking about a ray, okay, its drawing is going to look much like this. So we're going to start with an end point. Let's start with the end point F. Now what it states is that it's a portion of a line that starts at that point and continues forever in one direction. Now it doesn't matter what necessarily direction it goes in, it just needs to go start at that point and go the opposite direction. So let's go there, and it continues forever in one direction. So we need to draw an arrow representing that. So it's going to continue in this direction, and we're going to represent that by drawing the arrow on the end. Now, to finish up our drawing of a ray, we need to have two points. So we're going to add a point on the ray called G. So to go through and represent a ray, it starts at a point, it goes through another point, and it continues forever in that direction. So it starts at F, continues through G, and on. All right, now we need to go through and name this particular ray. So we can go through and start with the word ray, because that's what figure we have. Now, Unlike a line, a plane, and a line segment, order does matter in this case. So if I start with the point F as my endpoint, so we start at F and it goes through G, that means I need to start with F and then end with G. So this is ray F, G. Order matters, so that is the only way that I can name that ray. Now there is a bit of shorthand for rays as well. So we start with FG and much like we did with a line and a line segment, we're going to draw the figure above it. So we're going to draw a little ray above FG. Order matters. You have to start with that endpoint and then end with the point that it goes through. Starts at F, goes through G. All right, so those are our five terms that we're taking a look at today. And that gives us our three undefined terms of a point, line, and plane, and our two defined terms of a line segment and array. So that accomplishes learning goal number one. Now, example one below this talks about having you go through and give an example, so my thought was a real life example, of each of the following geometric figures and then state if they are defined or undefined. For a matter of time, I am not going to run through this example right now. Okay, I'm going to leave that for you to run through and think about based off the definitions that we have talked about and different clues that I have given as I've drawn these or given different shapes or talked about them. If you need to, you can ask about these later next time you see me, or you can take a look at my completed notes that I have uploaded, and you can see what I've answered for each of these to give you an idea of an example of each of these. You could also look online to see what other people have thought of for different examples.
All right, so continuing on, we need to now take a look at the segment edition postulate. So if I can line this up here. Let's take a look at our first postulate. So a postulate is just a fancy way of saying like a theorem or stated fact. A postulate is stated fact. It's not something we have to go through and prove. It's just one of the building blocks of geometry. It's just something that is known and there really is no need to prove it. So the first one we're going to look at is the segment addition postulate. So the segment addition postulate states that let points A, B, and C be collinear points. Collinear means that they all reside on the same line. So points A, B, and C are all on the same line segment. Now, if point B is between A and C, as we see here, then we can say that the segment AB plus the segment of BC equals the entire thing of AC. So in layman's terms, this means this part plus this part equals the whole thing. So, for example, if I know, let's say, AB is four units long, and then I know that BC is three units long, what this postulate states, and what reason states, is that if this part plus this part equals the whole thing, then 4 plus 3 equals 7. So the whole length of this segment is going to be 7 units long. So that means AC is 7. Now, segment addition postulate will pop up here and there. Um, it's not something we're going to dive too much into, and it's not going to show up a ton in your homework. But it's something good to talk about as it's one of those building blocks of geometry. And what I really want to do is just run through one example and I will leave the other one for you to run through if you would like. So let's take a look at example 2A. So for example 2A we have three points L, M, and N and they're all collinear. So we have two different segments and then the whole larger segment of LN. So if I'm going through and writing the segment addition postulate like this, but based off this diagram, my formula or equation, I should better say, is LM plus MN is going to equal the whole thing of LN. So LM plus MN equals the whole thing of LN. Now, example two asks us to use the postulate to find the missing segment length. The missing segment length is right here, and it's the whole thing of LN. So what we're going to do is plug in the values that we know. They tell us that LM, based off the diagram, is 9. And they tell us that MN is 6. And then we do not know what the value of LN is. So that's what we are trying to figure out. Now, the great thing about, about example 2A is that there's not a lot of solving we have to go through and do. We really have this problem set up for us. So I have 9 plus, sec, 9 plus 6 equals question mark. So I want to figure out what this is. Well, if I have 9 plus 6, all I have to do is just add those together. So if I add them together, we get 15, which means 15 is the length of LN, meaning the segment LM plus MN, or 9 plus 6, equals the whole thing of LN, which is 15. All right, so I'm going to leave example 2B for you to run through and do if you'd like. 
Again, it's in my completed notes if you'd like to take a look, or if you need help with it, just ask me next time you see me. All right, let's move on to our third learning goal, which is gonna encompass two different formulas. So let's take a look at our first formula, part of that learning goal, which is going to relate to the distance formula. So the distance formula is something you may have seen before in a previous math class, whether it's Algebra 1 or Pre-Algebra class. But we're going to talk about it today because it will pop up occasionally throughout geometry. So the distance formula states that the distance between two points, x1, y1, and x2, y2 on the coordinate plane is the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. So what that means is you're going to take two points of that line, so right here and here, you're going to go through and subtract the x's and square them, and then add it with the subtraction of the y's squared, and then you're going to take the square root of that quantity. So first thing I do want to mention before we jump into using the distance formula. This formula overwhelms some people because they fear that there's no way they could remember this. What I want you to know is that you will never be asked to memorize this formula. We will always provide it for you, and it's always something you will have access to. So do not worry about that. So all we really care about is can you use it, not necessarily if you can memorize it. So with that said, let's go ahead and get into example three which is going to have us go through and use the distance formula to compare the length of two lines or line segments. So for example three, it states, use the distance formula to find the length of the given segments. And what it wants us to do for example A is determine whether AB and CD have the same length. So the two segments we're talking about is AB and CD. So our goal for this problem is to figure out how long both of these segments are and then figure out if they are the same length. Now, as much as I know you would love to go through and use a ruler or go through and measure it, understand that sometimes the scales of drawings might be a bit off because they might not be perfect. So we cannot necessarily rely on that in this case. So we do need to go through and use the distance formula. Now, before we start using this lovely formula, we need to go through and identify our points before we can start plugging stuff in. So let's go through and figure out the points for lines A, B, and C, D. So first, we have point A. This is going to be our first endpoint. So it's going to be at negative 4, 4. Our other end point is B, and B is going to be at 1, 2. For the other line, for C is our first end point. It's going to be at 2, 3. And then for D, it's going to be at four comma negative two. All right, so we have gone through and identified our four points for the two lines. Now, we just need to work on a line at a time. So let's go ahead and take a look at the line AB. So just for visual purposes, we're gonna separate those two. Now, if we're looking for the distance between A and B, okay, these are our two points. I'm going to list A as my x1, y1, and B as my x2, y2. Now, you do not have to visually go through and write what your x1, y1, and x2, y2 are. For me, 
it just helps keep them straight because you can get lost sometimes in this. So it's helpful to provide just a little bit of guidance. Don't feel too proud about it. If it's something that helps you, by all means, go ahead and use it. All right, so we're gonna now dig in to this problem because we now know my x1 is negative four, my y1 is four, x2 is one, and y2 is two. So the length of AB is the square roots of x2 minus x1. So x2 is one, and x1 is negative four. So this is going to be one minus and negative four squared plus then the formula states y2 minus y1 so we have two and four so it's going to be two minus four squared all right so there is a lot of stuff there and there's a couple different steps we need to go through and do to solve this. The first thing you're going to do is you're gonna solve inside the parentheses. So you're gonna solve the addition or subtraction that is inside the parentheses. So if we take a look at our first set of parentheses, and I'm gonna get us set up format-wise so we can get working. So again, AB is equal to the square root of, and then that's what we'll find out. So I have one minus a negative four right here. Minus a negative, if you will recall from past math classes, because we have two negatives, that makes it a positive, so this becomes one plus four. Now, something that I just wanna let you guys know, do not feel too proud to use a calculator. It is quite all right. It's not something I'm not going to recommend. In fact, I do recommend and suggest you do. Reason being, so you can get comfortable using a calculator before you get to any of your big standardized tests, like the SAT. Okay, It's not that I don't think you can do the mental math. It's just remove that layer of uncertainty about math and go ahead and use the calculator. So if I have one minus the negative four, Sorry, one minus a negative four. We then end up with five as our answer because minus a negative becomes plus. So one plus four gives us five. So I have five to the power of two plus if we do two minus four, we end up with negative two as our answer for that set of parentheses. So we have plus negative two to the power of two. All right, so your next step is to go through and evaluate the exponents. So that means I need to take five to the power of two and negative two to the power of two. Remember, exponents just mean how many times you're gonna multiply this number by itself. So two means we're gonna do five times five or, again, you can use your calculator, and we can go through and do five to the power of two, and we get 25. So we end up with the square root of 25 plus, and then we're gonna take negative two to the power of two. Anytime you have a negative number, please put that number inside parentheses, close the parentheses, and then put it to the power of. So in this case, we would end up with a positive four. Okay, the reason why I caution you, okay, because the true answer here is positive four, if you do not put that in parentheses, and you need negative two to the power of two without parentheses, you end up with negative four. The calculator separates the negative as something different, so it never applies the square to it. So please be sure to use parentheses and then square your number.
so you can get your positive. All right, so at this point, I now have the square root of 25 plus 4, which 25 plus 4 is 29. Now, hopefully, if I go through and take the square root of this number, I can get a nice whole number. So let's go through and check. So if I take the square root of 29, I end up with an awful decimal of 5.385, so on. Okay, that's a Karami decimal. That's not really anything neat, nice. That's not precise because it would continue on. So unfortunately, I cannot use my decimal in this case. In some cases, you might have to simplify this square root, but in this case, the square root of 29 cannot be simplified. Therefore, the length of AB is in fact the square root of 29. Now, if you get to a problem and you're struggling to simplify, either look it up online or just ask me next time you see me and I'll be more than happy to explain how you simplify square roots as the homework site will ask you to be a little more precise and sometimes it does want you to simplify. All right, so for a matter of time, I am not gonna run through and find the distance of CD. I am going to leave that for you just because I don't wanna take up too much of your time right now. You would run through the same idea as we did with this first part of AB. So you would establish your x1, y1, and your x2, y2. And then you would go through and plug it into the formula and solve it like we did with AB. So take your new x1, y1, x2, y2, plug it in, and go through and solve. This is a great chance to go through and practice. If you want to pause and go through and run through it, I would suggest you do so, but that's up to you. To give you a little guidance, you should, if you have gone through and done your math correctly in each of the steps, you should find that the length of CD is also the square root of 29, meaning these two are in fact the same length. So that means that yes, AB is equal to CD. All right, so that is example 3a. Now there is a B part to this example, and it's gonna have you go through and do the same thing, but with two different lines for this. Now, I am not gonna run through this part as I am trying to save time and not take your whole class period here. So I'm gonna leave that for you if you want some practice. It is done in my completed notes, so if you want to take a look at how I did it, by all means give it a look. All right, let's talk about our last term here and then our last formula. So the last thing that we are going to take a look at today is the midpoint. Now, you may recall the midpoint from previous classes, but right now we're going to go through and give a brief definition and explanation. So the midpoint of a line segment is the point that divides the segment into two segments that have the same length. Okay, the midpoint, another way that you can think about the midpoint, if I can move this down here for a second, is think of it as the middle. Okay, so the midpoint is the middle of that line segment. So let's say, for example, I have this line segment here, and let's say that it's the line segment x, y. The midpoint is going to be the middle of it. So let's say it's approximately right there, which I'm a little off. And we'll name our midpoint m. So m is that middle spot of that line segment. Now. In terms of numbers, okay, to think about it, if the whole segment of XY, let's say, is 10 units long, 
knowing that m is our midpoint, that means that I know that this part is 5 and this part is 5 as well. These two have to be equal length because m is our middle point, so it cuts it in half. So 10 divided by 2 is 5, so both segments are 5. <clears throat> now, a bit of shorthand that you will see in the future is this idea of tick marks. And what it means is that each of those parts where a tick mark is represented are equal. So I could do that with a tick mark here and here. And what that means is that this segment is equal to this segment. All right, one last thing I want to talk about before we get into the midpoint formula is that a line, ray, or other figure that passes through the midpoint of a segment is called the segment bisector. So if I have my midpoint there, if I have a line that passes through that point, this line is referred to as our segment bisector because it cuts that segment into two parts. Way to think of it, bisector, okay? First two letters bi means two, and sector means parts. So the segment is in two parts. So it cuts it into two parts, and they are in fact two equal parts. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at our midpoint formula. It's our last formula for today, and it's going to be that final part of our learning goals for today. So the midpoint formula is going to state this. The midpoint M of a line AB with endpoints x1, y1 and x2, y2 is going to be given by this formula. It's going to be x1 plus x2 divided by 2 comma y1 plus y2 divided by 2. The comma means that we're not going to get one single number at the end, but in fact, we're going to get a coordinate point. So x comma y. So we're going to add the x's, divide by 2, add the y's, divide by 2. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at our fourth and final example. Now, example four is going to ask us to find the midpoint and then determine what quadrant the midpoint lies in. Now, because I realize it's been a little bit since you've thought about the coordinate plane quadrants, I've given you a little key right here to reference, so that way you remember what the quadrants are. You can always look it up online if you need. If we're thinking about our quadrants, Okay, quadrant one is in the top right, and then you move counterclockwise. So it's quadrant two, three, and four. Just a quick little bit of shorthand. Okay, in quadrant one, both the X and Y have to be positive. Quadrant two, the X is negative, but the Y is positive. Quadrant three, both X and Y are negative. And then quadrant four, the X is positive, and the Y is going to be negative. So use that as a key and a reference as you go through and solve these problems in your homework, or as we go through in the notes. Something else to note, okay, you may hear the term origin. The origin is the middle of the coordinate plane, and it's zero, zero. So if you're asked if the midpoint is the origin, you want to know if your point is 0, comma, 0. All right, so let's quickly go through and solve A, and I will leave B for you to practice. So for A, it states if JK has the endpoints 7, 0, and negative 5, comma, negative 4, then the midpoint of M of JK lies in quadrant 4. So we want to know if the midpoint ends up in quadrant 4. So first step is to go through and identify your x1, y1, and your x2, y2. 
Then we are going to go through and use our midpoint formula to go through and solve this. Much like with the distance formula, you do not have to memorize this. You just have to know how to use it. So midpoint formula states this, that it's x1 plus x2 over 2, comma y1 plus y2 over 2. So x1 plus x2, so we have 7 and negative 5. So it's going to be 7 plus negative 5 over 2, comma, and then it's y1 plus y2, so 0 plus a negative 4 over 2, and then end parenthesis. So what we're going to go through and do here is solve each of these parts. So we're just going to add the top parts of the fractions first. So we're going to do 7 plus a negative 5, and we end up with 2. So we have 2 over 2, comma, 0 plus a negative 4 gives us negative 4. Now, because we have fractions, that's going to imply that we need to do division. So if I do 2 divided by 2, we end up with 1. And negative 4 divided by 2 is going to give us negative 2. So my midpoint is going to be at 1, negative 2. It wants to know if this is going to be in quadrant 4. So x is positive, y is negative. Quadrant 4, x has to be positive, y has to be negative. So my answer to this is yes. It is in quadrant 4. All right, so I will leave part B for you to go through and practice. Again, it's done in my completed notes if you want to see how I did it. Ask if you have any questions with it. All right, so that completes section 1-1 for Geometry A. That is your first set of notes and our first video for this trimester. If you have any questions or need any help with any parts, just let me know next time you see me, and I will go through and explain or help you where you need help. So hopefully this has been helpful and you have learned something, and I do apologize. This is a lot longer video than you will normally experience. The first couple lessons are a bit longer, and I do apologize for that. Know that not every lesson you experience this trimester is going to be this long. So in advance, I apologize, but know that you can always come back or watch different parts if you need to, and you can move forward if you feel comfortable. All right, so that concludes our lesson and our video for today. I hope you learned something, and I hope you have a great day. Bye.